who's coming to us, you know, we all know him from being at Cedars and now at um, William Beaumont in Michigan. Um, and, you know, I'm just so happy you can travel here and be here with us live and in person. So it's great to see you back. And so Wade's going to talk about the, uh, not the ablative part, but the resective parts and what we can use either with EMR, ESD, or, or anything else. So Wade, welcome. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. It's great to see you guys. Um, so actually, I was telling the guys earlier, it's my first trip since COVID, first time I got on a plane. So uh, thank you for pushing me and encouraging me to, to take that bold move. <laughs> All right. Um, really feels good to be back and attending these live sessions, and hopefully there'll be much more of them. So I was tasked with uh, talking about optimizing resection techniques for EMR, uh, uh, for Barrett's esophagus. So uh, let me briefly go over the guidelines because uh, we're supposed to abide by them. And uh, as I go through them, you'll see some things maybe we're shifting away from. So mucosal abnormalities should be sampled separately, preferably by EMR. And this is a point I'm gonna repeat again and again and again, because really this is the main thing that happens that then deters complete eradication or proper treatment. So biopsying a lesion you should, should really be avoided. So if you cannot do EMR or you don't do EMR and you see a subtle lesion or nodularity and EMR is not your, in your, you know, things that you do, just leave it alone and just send it to somebody who can then do it. There's no point in biopsying saying, well, it's normal but I'm suspicious or it's high grade dysplasia or whatever. It's not gonna change what needs to be done for that lesion, okay? So it should, again, be done these nodularities or subtle lesions should be removed by EMR as the initial diagnostic and therapeutic, period. And these are the guidelines, this is not what I'm saying. Um, and then based on the histology, then you decide what the next step will be. And so if you have a patient who has, you undergo an EMR for a lesion and it has high grade dysplasia, intramucosal cancer, and you've taken it out, then you proceed with other ablative modalities that Dr. Gadam briefly touched about you know, depending on what you have and what you think is the right thing. Now, if you do an EMR and you take out that three, four, five, eight millimeter, centimeter, 13 millimeter lesion, and it says, well, you weren't deep enough. There was still some dysplasia at the bottom. That, then the assumption, or sometimes I'll say it's not clear, there's cautery effect. You've all seen those reports. The assumption has to be that you've left something behind. And so then you need to go back and take that out. Whether you do it by ESD, EMR, surgery, depends on the pathology and how suspicious it is. And this is a strong recommendation. So unless you have clear margins, the assumption is there's something left behind. If you have a patient with a T1A, so it's a mucosal disease, very early, then endoscopic therapy is the preferred therapeutic approach. So even if you have a superficial carcinoma in situ, that's not a patient that you send to surgery. You proceed with endoscopy. If it's a T1B, so it's deep into the submucosa, okay, then before you embark on anything, it really should be a multidisciplinary approach. So you get your oncologist, your surgeon, and your interventional endoscopist, and you kind of hash it out. And depending who's got the stronger pull, that's probably where it may go. Um, but in some patients, endoscopic therapy may be an alternative strategy to a sophagectomy, especially if it's a superficial invasion into the submucosa, so it's still a SM1. And it's well differentiated, and there's no lymphovascular invasion, especially if they're a poor surgical candidate. So this was in, I think, 2016. So now the ASGE came out and said, well, we're gonna have guidelines for resection. What are those guidelines? So, in a patient with low-grade dysplasia, endoscopic eradication therapy compared to surveillance is the recommendation. However, if a patient wants to avoid procedures unless they're absolutely necessary, then it's appropriate to do surveillance. I'm not talking about visible lesions. Completely flat, random biopsy, low-grade dysplasia. Personally, I encourage those patients to undergo some form of ablative therapy. However, if it's high-grade dysplasia, then endoscopic eradication therapy compared to, to surveillance is the recommendation. Meaning, if there is high-grade dysplasia, 
that, that uh, Barrett's needs to go. Nodular, EMR, ESD, flat, other modalities. You don't survey high-grade dysplasia. Now, if a patient has bad esophagus with high-grade dysplasia or intramucosal esophageal cancer, we recommend, that's not me, of course, it would be nice, but no, the ASGE, against surgery compared to endoscopic therapy. That's a strong statement that you do not refer those patients to surgery. The first line should be endoscopic eradication therapy. Now, if a patient has high-grade dysplasia intramucosal cancer with Barrett's esophagus, those patients, and the reason is because they have a very low risk of lymph node metastases. So if it's proven, eventually, that it was only high-grade dysplasia, the risk of lymph node metastases is zero. And if it's only intramucosal cancer, it's 2%. And so those patients, it would be curative, and, you, and you've avoided surgery in those patients. Now, if a patient's referred for endoscopic eradication therapy, we recommend endoscopic resection of all visible lesions compared to no endoscopic resection of visible lesions, meaning you see a subtle lesion, you don't want to do EMR, you say, well, I'll do RFA, I'll do cryo, I'll do this. That is not appropriate any visible lesion. That's where the first two talks that preceded mine really factor in. Unless you really do a thorough evaluation, you won't pick up that subtle lesion, and then that subtle lesion may actually harbor malignancy, and you, all you're doing is you're just burning the surface, and now you've got underlying tumor that's covered up. So you do your thorough evaluation, any visible lesion needs to go. If a patient with bats and dysplasia and mucosal, um, with dysplasia and mucosal esophageal cancers referred for endoscopic therapy, we recommend against routine complete endoscopic resection of the entire Barrett's compared with endoscopic resection of the visible lesion followed by ablation of the remaining Barrett's. So you take out the visible lesion, then you manage the rest with the ablative modalities Dr. Gadam talked about. Otherwise, if it's completely flat, then you go with the ablative. Visible lesion needs to go endoscopically with resection. So the AGA then came out um, a couple years ago talking about ESD in general and specifying areas. But what is their definition of a curative endoscopic resection in Barrett's esophagus, meaning it is cured? Well, the lateral and deep margins have to be negative. So if it's a small lesion, less than 15 millimeters, there's a good chance with, a, with the modalities I'm going to talk about that you'll be able to remove that lesion and block. So you have to have a, a, a specimen that the pathologist can look at telling you it's gone. And only then can you say this is curative. And it's not just lateral margins, it's deep margins. The pathology has to be well differentiated to moderately differentiated. So if it's poorly differentiated, that patient needs further management, probably surgery, because it would not be a curative resection. The specimen has to show no LVI, no lymphovascular invasion, and no submucosal or only superficial, less than 500 microns submucosal infection, so SM1. And so, of course, you have to be deep into the submucosa for the pathologist to tell you the deep margin is negative, but not only is it negative, the depth of invasion into the submucosa. So you do have to have that discussion with your pathologist. Not every pathology is, you know, up to speed on all these things and measuring depth and all that. What is a high-risk specimen for lymph node metastases? Because this is what it's about. Well, if you've got positive deep margins, or they can't tell you for sure, then there's that risk. If it's deep into the submucosa, more than 500 microns, then that has a high risk of lymph node metastases. The pathology, as I said, was poorly differentiated, or actually the specimen does say there is lymphovascular invasion. The assumption has to be the lymph nodes are involved. Or the optimal, and that all really goes back to the first talk, identifying the margins of the lesion. How big is it? Is this look invasive or not? And all that stuff. So we've talked about this uh, high resolution endoscopy. Again, it's very good for most. If you do, if you take your time and really do a, a good job, you can find these subtle lesions. And then, of course, MBI, endocarmine, which is not available anymore, et cetera, all help in identifying lesions. So again, it's very important you start with the evaluation. It's not about just throwing a band and just take a lesion out. 
Now, <clears throat> once people start taking out specimens, the question is, is the pre, and obviously all these lesions historically were being biopsied before they were being sent. Does the biopsy specimen actually correlate with what you take out? If they tell you, oh, this is high-grade dysplasia, do you then assume that there is no invasive cancer? Or if it's only low-grade dysplasia, is there no high-grade dysplasia? And interestingly enough, in several studies, that was not the case. So in this study, 138 patients, um, low-grade dysplasia, 11%, high-grade, 63 and early esophageal cancer, 26% prior to intervention. As a result of EMR, 10% 10 per, 10 of patients got upgraded. So, and this was irrespective, interestingly, if there was a lesion, a visible lesion or not. And so you have to keep that in mind when you refer these patients or when you're, when you're doing these procedures as to what, what method you're gonna use, that there is a chance that the pathology may be actually more advanced than what you initially thought. So, how do you take these lesions out endoscopically? Uh, I'll talk about the three main modalities and then I'll go in a little bit detail. The first is the endoscopic resection cap. So this is not the cap that you have seen in the last two videos. These are not the short caps with a side hole. These are the more rigid caps, and they either come with a flat or an oblique uh, uh, surface, and they have a ridge on the inside, and uh, probably all of you have seen it at some point. And so in this study, which was one of the first studies, they injected a, a solution to lift these lesions, and it had uh, diluted epinephrine. And then you, you put a cap on a normal area, you create this snare, uh, the snare around the ridge, and then you suction in the mucosa, and then you close the snare around it. Unfortunately, I do not have a video. Um, so you create some kind of a pseudo polyp. You grab this tissue, and then you cut it off. And in this study, they use pure coag. And I personally since have switched to uh, cut, uh, but in, in the initial studies, they were using pure coag to do this. So you inject, you suction it in, you snare it, and you take it off. The other method that I think is much more popular, and I'll explain why in the next few slides, is the multi-band mucosectomy. So what this is, it's basically, all of you do esophageal varices, it's no different. You suction in the, uh, the target lesion, and then you throw a band. And after you throw in a band, there's a special snare that comes with it that goes through the same channel while you still have a thread, and this device has six bands on it. And then you uh, snare it off, as you see in the cartoon here. Does this show? Okay, yeah. So there it is, suctioning, and there's the band there, and then you take it off. Um, I, didn't, I forgot to go, but yep. While here, you've got the injection. You can see this has like a crescent shape. I mean, not a crescent shape, uh, an oblique cap. It's not the same length here. It's longer than here. You inject. You actually suction it. The snare goes around, and you take it off. So a little bit different. So the technique, and I, I have to say, I don't usually mark my lesions before I take them out. Uh, you know, initially I did. I, I want to believe with time that I've gotten better, but uh, if you were to do it the appropriate and true right way, you should mark because then at the end you should see none of your markings, meaning you've taken everything out. I do it for ESD, but not for me, MR. Maybe I should revisit that. So anyway, you suction it in, you release the band, so a polyp. Some people say, well, it doesn't matter if you cut above or below the band. Um, at least in the initial studies, they would close underneath the band. Um, I put in there the jiggle, uh, which is what I used to do so psychologically. I think it helps me. I just jiggle it literally after I close it so that if it has suctioned in any muscularis propria, it releases it. That, there's no science to it. Uh, and then what they did was, again, use a pure coag, and they cut that lesion off. So... What if it's a lesion that's more than, you know, 7, 8, 10, 15 millimeters? Do you still use this technique? Well, that's what's called piecemeal resection. Now, when you do that, you're basically taking out one area, cutting it, going to the next, 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 etc. What happens is you end up with these small islands, and now you're stuck, and it really feels bad. So what you need to do is overlap. 
So you don't, don't be afraid of overlapping a little bit. And they say about 10 to 25 percent, probably err on the 10 percent. Um, so you have to have that edge. So you really should start from one side and just walk your way to the other, not hop around. And, and you, after you take out the first piece with some normal, go to the next, a little bit of what's left, and some no area that you've already taken out, and you proceed in stepwise fashion. If you do have a residual bridge, you could maybe inject it a little bit, lift it, and with a small snare, take it off. Or if you can't, then you could do APC on that what's left. And these should be very small islands. There shouldn't be a lot of them. So what's the advantage of a multiband uh, mucosectomy over the EMR technique? Well, it doesn't require submucosal injection, and the rationale is the muscle layer, the musculus propria, will retract after you throw that band. So it's not kept in. While with the other technique, when you're suctioning, you're suctioning the entire esophageal wall, and there's a good chance when you close that snare that you will actually grab the muscle layer. You could do six consecutive bands, one after the other, so it's faster and it's less costly, time, patient discomfort. Is that me just saying it, or is there actually studies to prove that? Well, so this was actually a randomized trial comparing the two techniques, 84 patients, uh, 42 in each arm, who underwent piecemeal endoscopic resection for Barrett's comparing with the multi-band technique versus the CAP technique. And actually the procedure time was significantly shorter with the multi-band technique. It was less costly. However, the resection specimen was smaller because the band and the cap are smaller than the EMR cap because that can suction in more tissue. As a result, you get more. And the complications, or the perforations, I should say, in the multi-band, they still had one perforation in 42 patients. The other one had three. It wasn't statistically significant. However, you know, it, it was more. Um, Interestingly, the maximum thickness you would think if you suction in and take out versus the band, you may get more, but the, at least in the study, there was no difference in the thickness of the specimens and the amount of submucosa that was resected. So uh, again, the, the multi-band seems to be faster, cheaper, and although, interestingly, you're not suctioning, you're not injecting the submucosa because you think that when you inject it, it's gonna be safer, it didn't seem to be associated with more perforations. And although it's the specimens were small, it really didn't matter on the long run. So this is also a relatively new um, method for these small islands. So just like we have hot avulsion technique for colon polyps, there's hot avulsion for Barrett's, okay? So this study of 35 patients who had 124 residual areas anywhere between one to seven millimeters, they were treated with hot avulsion and they all achieved complete eradication about a year and a half out with follow-up. So it seems to be a, a also another technology where if you can't lift that residual, you can just use the hot avulsion technique and uh, for the residual Barrett's after EMR. All right, so ESD, that's the, the big one now. A lot of people advocating for ESD for these lesions. Is there, is there rationale or proof for it? Well, the ACG guidelines basically say that EMR is generally adequate to reveal the depth of invasion, which is the most important variable in the clinical decision making. Mind you, this was in 2016, and as you all know, anytime a playbook gets published, it's probably been working on for at least two or three years. So the data is a little bit older based on what's available. Now, the advantage of ESD, of course, is when you take a piece out, it's in, it's, you, you preserve everything and I'm gonna have to stop. And I may have to stop. Uh, and resume later on. So we'll keep the EMR ESD discussion for later. Okay. All right. That's right. Yep. So, uh, Apati, we'll do a partial pause here, and then we're going to wait. We'll be back because this is a great topic. Um, you know, it's my, we're going to switch.